welcome back to Endurance Icons, where we talk to people who are absolutely crushing it in the world of endurance sports. Today, we are talking to John Kelly. He is a two-time Barkley Marathon finisher. He is a tech co-founder. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And, you know, busy family, father of three. So welcome, John. We're so happy. Four. Four. Yeah. He's correcting yeah. me for those of you who are watching online. Um, four children. Uh, welcome, John. Um, how are you doing today? Yeah, do, doing pretty well. Thanks very much. And you know, that that might be my own oversight there. I probably haven't updated the about me section on my blog in quite a while. It probably still says that I live in the UK as well. Um, but yeah, looking forward to, uh, to, to chatting with y'all. So let's not forget about the fourth child. Um, how old is your youngest? Uh, she's two. She's she's kind of just now on the hump, getting over potty training. So that'll be a big milestone when the the last one is done with that. We can get rid of all our our diapers and uh, fake potties and and all of that. Well, okay, everyone listening, keep that in mind as we talk about his training and what he's just gone through. He has four kids and one is two. So uh, that's extraordinary. So John, maybe um, give us a rundown. You've been, you're kind of a couple weeks off of the race here. So how are you feeling and kind of how's recovery going as a whole? It's going pretty well. Uh, so I started kind of easing back into running last week. Uh, the Generally, the, the biggest thing is uh, always kind of the, the mental recovery, uh, catching up on the sleep, dealing with the brain fog and just those uh, moments in the first week where it just, uh, you know, one second you'll be fine. And then one second, like, I, I have to lay down. I'm now plastered on the couch and, and cannot move for, for 30 minutes. So I'm, I'm past those, uh, doing pretty well, sleeping pretty well, uh, a few little niggles here and there, but, uh, should be back to full speed, uh, within a couple of weeks, hopefully. I love it. Uh, so before we dive in, I, we definitely want to focus lots on this 2023 kind of Barkley recap. But before we hop in there, I'd love to talk a little bit about uh, we have uh, a huge audience of runners, triathletes, ultra runners, cyclists, swimmers, you name it. Um, and you've kind of done a lot in this endurance world other than just ultra running. Tell us a little bit about this like triathlon kind of road running history that you have. Yeah, I, I kind of got back into it. I, took a solid decade off in college and grad school, uh, kind of did the intramural sports circuit, uh, which is good fun. But then as I was finishing up, I, I'd always wanted to see what I could do at longer distances, what I could do in a marathon, uh, decided I should go ahead and do that uh, be, before it got too late. And so I just signed up for a Marine Corps marathon and uh, kept progressing from there just you know thinking oh, I can do a little bit better or do a little bit more um did a couple more marathons and then decided I I should see what some of these other things I, I should explore the other options out there see what I enjoy see what I'm good at uh, I was also living outside of DC at the time which uh I, I mean the city's it's literally built on a swamp and it's it's hot and humid and, and miserable uh not very fun for running in the summer so I thought, well, I'll, I'll ride my bike. That'll be fun. There's some beautiful farmland in uh, Western Maryland for that. I thought, you know, I just got to add swimming. Like, well, it can't be too, too bad. Um, it, it was, I'm, I'm not good at swimming. I, um, I didn't grow up swimming other than, you know, like playing Marco Polo in the pool. And it, I very quickly found that it's it's not like running and biking. I can't just push, uh, you know, I can't do the same thing harder and faster and go faster. Uh, the harder I push, the harder the water pushes back. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that was a bit frustrating for me and, and wasn't something that I, I enjoyed th the most, uh, um, but it was a, a great experience, met a lot of great people and uh, had had a fun time uh, tackling a, a challenge that was a, a bit different for me. And tell us about, I believe at one point you raced as a pro in triathlon for a day. Tell us about that story. It, yeah. So I, I knew that I was going to switch 
full time to, to ultra running. Uh, I, I qualified for my, my pro card a few different ways in, in that last year. And so I said, well, just, just for the experience, I will, um, I'll go for pro for, for one race and, and see what that's like. I, I had also, you know, I'd finished high enough in a few others as an amateur to where like I would have been in the money if, if I had been pro, but, but I wasn't. So there's also that kind of thought in my head of maybe, maybe I can get a, a, a little, um, prize purse here, but, uh, I did that at the, the 2018, yeah, 2018 Ironman Arizona. Uh, you know, the the best part of the experience was probably there were pro only porta potties. Uh, mm-hmm. So you know, no line there, big perk. Uh, but the not so big of a perk for me was that I, you know there was a separate pro start, which meant I was starting the swim with. Um, all the other pros and and that's it and i was like immediately left in the dust like it it is amazing how quickly i was by myself on the swim no one to draft no one to help with deciding it was sunrise sun in my face it was it was bad and then you know just gradually it was it was kind of like here I am on my own, the pro men leave me, and then a little ways in, oh, there go the pro women, and oh, now go the amateur men, and now go the amateur women, and now, you know, uh, came out of water uh, pr- pretty pretty far back to the point that the pro athlete coordinator was, was she was visibly concerned. Uh, she, <laughs> she was like, are, are you okay? Did something happen? Um, what was but, the swim yeah. time? I think it was 118, 119, uh, around there. And, you know, again, the people in the pro field, like they're literally doing, well, not, not quite, but almost doing half my time, uh, on that, you, you know, there, there are people doing it in, in 40 something minutes. And so, uh, you know, but I, I hopped on my bike and I was just having fun uh, on my bike and, uh, had a good ride and, and then, got to thinking on the run you know I, I could I could still do okay here I, I could still go sub nine and I, I, I put down a pretty hard effort in the marathon and and had a, a great run and uh, managed to to still sneak uh, un, under nine hours there and I think that was the uh, at least at the time by by a solid three or four minutes it, it was the slowest swim ever in, in a sub nine hour Ironman so that is so, impressive still is going it, sub nine what a bike yeah, good, run combo holy good good way to finish things up yeah for sure so when we talk about kind of your training when you're coming to an event like Barkley, do you still like include some swimming and biking cross training in the mix or is it mostly uh running on the trails that you do i uh, i think that was the last time i swam still <laughs> uh, that's uh, what an you, epic last swim yeah yeah i don't know if i'll I don't know. Maybe one of these days I'll, I'll give it another go. Uh, see if I can uh, get, take another shot at one of those those age group, um, the, the the Koa bowls the, at, at at Kona. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've just barely missed that uh, on, on my trip there. So maybe one day. But yeah, no no swimming uh, at the moment. Uh, I haven't. I would love to be able to ride my bike more, uh, especially here where I live now. The Blue Ridge Parkway is mm. just down the road. Beautiful place to ride. Uh, I just unfortunately have have not had time for it. Haven't really had time to work in cross training or strength training uh, in, into my schedule. Uh, the uh, I did do a few things in the UK uh, where I incorporated my bike. And so that was, those were kind of you know, passion projects, if you will. Uh, I, I moved there. There were a few big fell running rounds that I wanted to do. And I said, it would be really fun to do all of those at once and ride my bike in between them. So that's, uh, I just kind of made that up as my own challenge and, and went out and did it. And, and that was a lot of fun. But unfortunately, I, I haven't been on my bike very much since then, uh, which was over two years now so uh, one day i'll get back out on that hopefully soon 
So you were sticking to just running on the way to Barkley there. What uh, did you have kind of, were you meticulously tracking like how many hours a week you were doing or how many miles you were covering in a week? What did that look like? Uh, so I, I have a coach now that I've been working with for about the past four years that uh, has has been really great. If uh, I mean, he's uh, David Roach, fa- fantastic guy on, mm-hmm. on both the, uh, the, the physical and, and mental side of things. And um if if nothing else it's been an enormous uh relief for me to not have to to track those things on my own anymore to not constantly be stressed and worried about making my my training plan and then wondering like am i doing the right thing am i doing enough of the right thing should i be doing this other thing um i've I've had great results with him he's he's more than earned my trust i just I, i pull up my spreadsheet with what I'm supposed to do today and I, I go do it. And so that's uh, it really simplifies things and, and makes it easier. Um, you know, my, my Barkley training was interrupted a, a bit. I, I fell off a ladder, uh, broke my wrist, bruised my ribs. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't a pleasant experience, um, but it, it, I was, I was quite fortunate to, to still be able to, um, not have too big of an impact my training and, and get out there and, and still do Barkley. Yeah, I saw I think you had posted that Barkley was the first time you were actually able to use your poles since the uh, broken wrist. Yeah, well, it was the first time I ran without a cast, um, oh, wow. which, you know, I, I just kind of slid in there uh, under the wire on the, the healing schedule. And I, I told the orthopedist that I was I was I was doing something that was a, a long race that involved trekking poles and and he said oh oh, okay that that should be fine then i I didn't give him any any farther details uh on that i i I left it at that (laughs) Uh, too good so with the like you're doing all this training you have four kids a wife a busy job how do you like fit all of this into your weekly schedule uh it's it's very much been uh, a learning experience uh, over the, the past seven or, or eight years, however long I've been doing these things now, of uh, as uh, some of those family and, and career uh, constraints have increased, uh, so has my uh, experience and, and, and ability to, to fit training in around those things. Uh, working with my, my wife uh, on schedules on, on weekend plans on making some of my longer runs or in the past bike rides sort of family uh, events destination uh training if you will where you know maybe i'll run to the zoo or bike to this museum or, or whatever and, and meet them there and, and have a family day out the biggest thing for me when i, I started this um yeah, pro- probably about eight years ago uh, when I was I was working in, in D.C. And the, the biggest thing was all of my my weekday um, my miles on running were on the bike were my commute. Uh, and so I was taking time that otherwise would have just been wasted sitting in a car and on a train uh, or, or whatnot, um, getting my workout in uh, then. That, that was another complication for me with, with swimming. Like I, I couldn't, the Potomac River was right there um, to be fair, but I couldn't really swim to work. Uh, that's something where I had to take time in the evening to you know go to the pool and, and do that. So, uh, but yeah, all of my running and biking was, was commute and now I'm, I'm largely working from home. So I, I have a, a flexible schedule uh, which is again very very fortunate I can do that and uh, fit my runs in. I, I try to do my my running and my working when the kids are at school or asleep uh, for the most part, and try to block uh, you know my longer runs at least. I, I try to block those off on my calendar to be sure that you know that that fits in when it needs to fit in, uh, and instead of getting you know, having something dropped in the middle of that time block that disrupts it. And then I, you know, I'm left with trying to do it in the evening or or something. Mm -hmm. And you, I, I, we talked about it at the very beginning, but you, you know, you're a tech co-founder. 
um, of a company. So not to gloss over often when people hear professional ultra runner, they think that's all you do. Um, and we talked about your family, the fact of being a, a co-founder of a company, I would imagine that's a significant amount of time. Um, what sort of hours do you work? You said you work from home, but um, how do you manage that um, to make sure that that doesn't overtake your running and vice versa? Uh, it's It's been tough at times, uh, especially in, in some of the, the early stages of that where, you know, there were just there were four of us and the tech team was, was me like that. That was it. Um, it, it was, it was tough. And I kind of compare doing a startup to going back to grad school and that you have a lot of flexibility around when you can work, but you kind of always feel like you should be working. Like it's like any free second, you know, I should be doing this or that other thing or, or getting this done uh and it's it's great to have you know personal reward and personal stake and in, in the outcomes of those things but there were definitely some times where uh my my running was just kind of attempting my best to uh limp along with with whatever training i could fit in um and and so there there were some very uh high hour weeks uh where, where training was not great sleeping was even worse um and uh, you know i i don't say that as, as any sort of brag of, oh look how little i sleep like i you really need to sleep and you especially as an endurance athlete it is absolutely important and we sabotage ourselves so much by like spending all this time training and then like you know, if we got an hour extra sleep each night, it would do wonders uh, for that training actually having an effect. So fortunately, uh, as the company has grown, uh, we've been able to, to build our team out and uh, scale and, and distribute those responsibilities to where uh, I'm, I'm no, no longer kind of the only person uh, for, for some of these things. And I can work a much more normal, manageable schedule and, and also not worry about like, oh, I'm off in the mountains for an entire week. And I'm the only person that can do, you know, task X. What if what if that needs to be done? That's no longer the case. And so that's, that's uh, really great to have that. Um, there are definitely still uh, tough moments for, for sure, but it's, it's again been uh, progress uh, as uh, I've, as alongside my, my progress in, in endurance sports. So talking about frolicking in the mountains, I think it's time for us to hop into this uh, 2023 Barkley story. So first, before we get into some of the stories around it, I want to talk a little bit about whatever you can share on this in terms of the application process. So um, we had Aurelian Sanchez, we chatted with him last week, great conversation. Um, and we asked him about what his uh, essay was about as part of the application process. Maybe before we even get to that, do you need to write an essay every time you apply for like every year you've been into it? Or was it just one you had to write and you've kind of had been grandfathered in from there? Uh, so once you finish, um, that, that's really the only, well, there are a few qualifiers as well. If you win the Barkley Fall Classic um, or if you win Big Dog's Backyard, you're guaranteed entry. If you are a previous finisher of Barkley, you're guaranteed entry. Nice. So no, at this point, I don't really need to worry about writing an essay. You know, I, mine could just be, I'll see you at the gate, Glass. <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, I do still try to come up with something creative and uh, entertaining, at least to, to send him. Uh, the, the first years that I did it, I mean, definitely the first year that I did it, um, I, I had legit running credentials and backpacking credentials and uh, some of the attributes that a lot of people who have seen success at Barkley have. But, I, you know, I was by no means a, in, anywhere near the resume that I, I have now. Uh, fortunately, that was before the, the race blew up in popularity due to the documentary. And sort of my what, what clinched it for me, I'm almost certain, was uh, be, being the hometown boy. Uh, I grew up right next to Frozen Head. My family's been on a small farm there uh, 
next to those mountains for for 200 years and it's it's a rural area running isn't a thing there really uh and so having someone from this tiny rural community especially one with with roots going that deep uh who is a legitimate runner as well as you know the odds of that are, are pretty astronomical uh so i, I was able to uh, get in partially based on that and then from there uh yeah kind of my my performances themselves uh were, were the biggest thing uh, on my resume so um immediately following the race you shared two lessons um online um the first one being don't spend time or energy on things that you can't control and address this um i personally love alliteration so you gave three different things under that which was plan prepare and proceed so as you moved to prepare um, and plan and proceed for Barkley, what did the three of those look like um, coming to life for you? Yeah, and and there are a lot more of those posts coming. I, you know, I, awesome. I have no idea where that'll stop. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe never. number fifteen or twenty. At, who knows? Um, are you writing a book, John? I feel like Barkley lessons. Uh, so yeah, no, no, no time for that at the moment. Maybe one day, or maybe I'll just have someone kind of mash all these these posts together um but yeah so that is one on barkley that is absolutely critical because more so than other races there are so many unknowns there are so many variables um most of those you can't do anything about i don't know when laz is going to blow the conch and start the race i don't like the weather in east tennessee that time of year can be absolutely anything like i've been out there at barkley at night where the water jugs these gallon jugs of water are just frozen solid blocks of ice not like there's a little bit of icy crust around them just solid blocks of ice and then 12 hours later the the very next afternoon i'm going up the same climb and i'm absolutely baking in the afternoon sun wearing nothing but a t-shirt and shorts and and so you have these wild volatile swings and temperature and precipitation and, and wind it's it's very difficult to uh really have your your body ready for all of those at once uh, I also can't control what how he changes the course like the course changes a little bit each year maybe it's a small change maybe it's a big one I don't know, but like th those things I, I can, so that's, that's, that's where I, the way that I look at it, I, I have my plan, the, the things that I, I will definitely do, um, the things that are fully in my control when I go to bed, uh, the, the evening before the race, what kind of pace I start off with, what nutrition I bring along with me. Uh, these are choices that, that I can make. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're fully up to me for, for the most part, those other things, those other variables, um, you know, pe people are, are always asking me starting, you know, weeks before the race, like, oh, have you looked at the long range forecast? And I mean, for one thing, like again, East Tennessee in March, and you're looking at a forecast 21 days out, I'm sorry, it's wrong. <laughs> like, come on. Yes. Um, but e even like a week out, I'm still kind of like, well, I, I don't know, like it could change. I, I have, here's, here's my stuff I brought. I have my cold weather stuff. I have my hot weather stuff. Here's my rain gear. Like I am prepared for any of these possible conditions. I don't know what the actual conditions are going to be, but, but whatever they are, um, I I'm, I'm prepared for them. Uh, I, I know how I am going to respond to any of those those conditions, and the, like the last, game. yeah, yeah, it, it really is. Uh, you're you're trying to think as as many moves ahead as you can, and and know what you'll do uh, in in each situation, but you know you can't control what your opponent is doing. And, and so, you know, finally, the, the last thing was just, just proceed, just, just get on with it. And that's really the, the hardest one uh, so often. And, and I'm to the point where I, I try my best to have everything done um, 
two days beforehand to where that last day is just, you know, I relax, I kind of tune out, do whatever, kick my feet up, mentally disconnect and rest as, as best I can. Early on, uh, you, you know, it, my first two Barclays, the start times were late morning, like 11 a.m. Or, or something. Uh, and I, you know, I'm tossing and turning all night. Like, what was that sound? Was that it? Is it about to start? Did I hear rain? Is 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 the wind picking up? Like, all these things that like you're, you're worried about and you're anxious about, but I, I can't actually do anything, and it's hurting my ability to rest and to focus on the things that that do matter, like like getting sleep. And of course, I, I learned that lesson in the third year, uh, which it was the the first year I finished. But you know. I, of course, think I've, I've got it all figured out and I, I go to sleep and I, I finally like just in a deep rock solid sleep. And, and then he, he blows the, the conch at 1242 AM, you know, my crew's banging on my window after I've slept for a couple of hours. Are you kidding me? Like, are you serious right now? So, but it, it worked out. A thread I want to pull in what you just said, um, and you said it quickly, but you made a comment about like preparing for your opponent. And I think what's so unique about Barkley versus, you know, you came from triathlon, um, you've done so many different types of racing, you're racing people on the course. Um, what I find so unique about Barkley is your opponent is actually the course itself. It's not people. Um, and it's, it's working to find your own limits. Was there any sort of mental shifts that you needed to make when your opponent, I would say is actually the course itself? Uh, so, you know, there, there's, there's still some, some element of racing out there as well. Uh, I think different people have a different degree of that. Uh, the, the most important thing is, is to make sure that you don't get attached to, to someone that is, is going to drag you down, whether it's it's mentally or or physically. And, and so, you know, you've got to cut that cord as quickly as you can uh, if you get in that that spot where um, someone is, is slowing you down or just even their their negative thoughts are seeping into your own mind. Uh, those those can grow quickly. And so. I mean, probably the biggest change in mindset isn't isn't as far as having the course itself as a competitor, but having your other, you know, the other people out there as as teammates. Mm -hmm. And so that that's a, a bit of a shift um, for for those of us that have uh, focused so much on on racing uh, in, in other events, but it's it's really about um, increasing your odds as, as much as possible and, and just understanding that in an event like Barclay that requires such constant diligence and focus on every decision you make, eventually you're going to make a careless dumb decision. You're, you're going to momentarily lose focus and you know miss a turn or wander off in the wrong direction or, or do something else, fall asleep. Um, you know, that's, that's going to happen and say, you know, every decision you make, uh, there's a 10% a chance that, that you mess up. If it's just you, uh, then there's a lot more than 10 decisions um, out, out on the, the course. Eventually, almost certainly, you are going to mess up probably more than once. Um, I, I, I deal with probabilities uh, for, for a living. I should probably know that off the top of my head, but we'll just say it asymptotically uh, approaches uh, 100% uh, on the chance that at some point you mess up. If you're out there with someone else and every single decision is then a roll of two die rather than just the one that you know, you've got a 10% chance of messing up, but they've also got a 10% chance of messing up. The chance that you both mess up at the same time on the same decision and can't correct each other and cover for each other is, is quite small. Like it's, it's, it's a huge drop. That one, again, it probably asymptotically a, a approaches 10% or, or so. Um, don't quote me on that. I need to do that math later. <laughs> um, 
but you know, it's it's in any, any case just an enormous uh, help and an improvement to your odds to not have a race ending catastrophic mistake. And that's a perfect lead into the second lesson you shared, which is progress before perfection. And I'd love to know your self-described perfectionist. What does that look like in action for you, especially around Barkley? Uh, so, I, I mean, that's that's being able to to let go of a lot of the, the details, uh, really. Uh, I think the example I gave in the post was on the navigation, where it's, you know, people think of Barkley as an orienteering event. And in those types of events, you, you know, you've got to, you've got to set the declination on your compass, like depending on where you are on earth, your compass, when it points north, isn't pointing to true north, it's, you know, pointing within a few degrees of, of true north. And so you can adjust the declination on your compass to, to that, depending on where you are. Uh, it, you know, you can draw out the map and measure each turn down to a single degree uh, of, of accuracy. And uh, you know, to be honest, Lass doesn't even draw the map to, to that level of accuracy. And so it's um, a time consuming and futile endeavor to do that. And, and then to be actually out there and on one of those uh, descents or climbs and, and constantly checking to make sure you're going in just the right direction at just the right angle down to the single degree. Um, it's not only a huge time sink, you're probably going to mess up as a result of it because the, the course naturally follows the terrain. It, it goes, you know, it goes down a ridge line and then it hits a creek and then you follow the creek and, and so on. And so if you're just trying to walk in a perfectly straight line or, um, you know, it's, it's not, it's not going to end well. The, the ridge might curve slightly and take an arc around a giant drop in, into a uh, nasty gully. And so you, you've got to be able to run those lines, keep moving quickly and, and follow the terrain. And, and so again, if you get too bogged down in the details, if you try to get things too perfect, it's, it's just going to, to slow you down and it's going to uh, result in a bigger problem when things don't go exactly the way that you think they should. And where did you learn to navigate and how long did it take you to feel like you mastered it? Uh, I still wouldn't call myself a master navigator, to, to be honest. Um, it's, uh, I, did, I did Boy Scouts and, uh, as a kid, uh, spent a lot of time backpacking and, and doing long distance hikes uh, when I was older. And, and so, you know, you, you learn how to use a compass and, and, and a map. Uh, and, and those sorts of things. And, and those sorts of basic skills are, are really what you need. How, how do you uh, read a map? How do you take a bearing? Um, and, and how do you use some simple techniques like, like backstops and, and handrails, where again, you're using the terrain itself to, to guide you. And uh, I'd say backstops are, are probably the, the biggest thing where uh, on some of those uh, descents in particular, if it's night, if it's foggy, it's very difficult to um, follow the absolute perfect line. And you need to know that, oh, there's a creek at the bottom of this descent. I know that I'm going to hit that and then I stop and I, and I turn. And so you, you, you kind of think to yourself, I know that I'm going to miss a little bit. So I'm going to make sure that I miss a little bit to the right. So that then when I hit that creek, I know to turn to the left. Whereas if you, if you try to follow it dead on and then you miss a little bit, you, you don't know which side you're on. You, you don't know, do, do I need to turn left? Do I need to turn right? Uh, I'm not sure. Hmm. And speaking of landmarks, I know that uh, your final loop, uh, you chose clockwise um, and you shared in your 2017 race report that that direction actually has personal meaning to you. Meaning that like right before you finish the race, you can see uh, your family uh, where you grew up, um, in the distance. Now in, in the year that you finished for the first time, you weren't able to see that. I wanted to see, um, was that the main reason this year that you chose that loop? And were you, if so, were you able to see, uh, where you grew up as you, uh, made the final descent to Barkley? 
Yeah, so that that was definitely one of the reasons. Um, the the other was that I'm I'm simply more confident navigating the the clockwise loop. Uh, I you know at, at some point in the race I was I was running with a few other people and I thought oh well if we get there I'll I'll let them choose. Um, I'm I'm good either way. But then towards the end I was. When, when things get tough, as they inevitably do, uh, I, I wanted that direction. I was confident, and uh, I also had it in my mind that you know some of these people, it's their first time. They're they're equally unconfident in either direction. So you know why why, why does it matter? Um, but that that personal uh, connection and, and meaning was was definitely a, a part of it as well. Uh, that that was a, a big reason that. I wanted clockwise the first time I finished. I had this big vision in my head that, you know, I would triumphantly go up this final climb on chimney top, a mountain that I spent a lot of time on as a kid. Uh, my my family's farm is is right at the bottom of it, and I'd be able to get to the top and rip out my last page and look down over my my childhood home and uh, that 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 would be it. And Instead, it was raining and cold and foggy and windy, and I was deliriously sleep deprived. Uh, not at all what, what I had envisioned. So this year, uh, I saw the opportunity to, to actually have that, and, and I did. It was, it was beautiful. It was, it, it, the conditions were perfect. The timing was perfect. I, I did that climb at sunset. And so got to enjoy that the entire way up. Uh, had a nice clear view, uh, good comfortable conditions at the top and, and sat and enjoyed that for a little while before uh, heading down into camp. Still, you know, fully aware of myself and my decisions and, and able to uh, enjoy and absorb the moment. That's really special because I know in 2017, when you described your experience, it was, you know, where you were fighting I would say that delirium of you were, you mentioned that you needed to keep running right until you hit that gate because you were so afraid you were going to fall asleep. Um, and it's, it's wonderful that you didn't have that in your last moments of Barkley this time. Um, but you, you've talked a lot about being able to take physical negatives and turn them into positives, like using when you get very sleep deprived and tired, you can also use the cold. I know you use that to counter falling asleep before. Is that something that you've cultivated and really worked on or, or how do you make sure that you can see the negatives that you experience both in race and I would say life um, and keep turning those into positives? Uh, it, yeah, it's some of those things are, are definitely uh, gained through, through experience, uh, things that I've, I've tried and that have worked for me before. Uh, some of them are, are kind of you have to improvise sometimes when you're out there. Uh, this time I, I had no alarm on on my the the alarm on my watch wouldn't make any sound. Uh, it would flash at me, but it, I don't know if the speaker was broken or what. But no sound, no 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 nothing that would actually wake me up. And so being able to to do that, and uh, you know we we mentioned the the plan prepare proceed earlier on, but, you know, being able to adapt and improvise is uh, always a, a part of that as well. Uh, there are going to be uh, unforeseen obstacles and, and challenges and having the experience to have just, again, been there before and uh, not get too flustered uh, when those happens, when things don't go to plan when there are things that you didn't prepare for and, and just being able to, to keep a calm, cool head and, and rationally think through, you know, what are the things that I can do here and, and what's going to uh, help my situation. And so that's serves me well on things like Loop 5 of Barclay, but also uh, with, it, you know, being a father, uh, working at a startup, uh, most of these things, uh, you know, the, the, I would say that the main reason for me that I'm I still do these sorts of multi-day events and uh, can justify the time spent on them is is because of of how it helps me improve in those other areas of my life. 
So you talked about being really with it for Loop 5 there, but I feel like we can't totally come over the uh, the wild story that you shared on Instagram. And I definitely recommend everybody, all our listeners, go check out the two-part uh, explanation of the story. But tell us about your uh, story of seeing your old friend in the woods on Loop 5. Yeah, I um, I had been trying to find uh uncomfortable spots to sleep in i i uh laid down in a creek uh, I, nice ice cold creek uh early on in the loop got about five minutes of sleep be- before i woke up I, I mean the idea there is uh to to be uncomfortable enough that at some point my body is going to care more about the discomfort than the lack of sleep and wake up and say get moving again before you get too cold and so you know i got that five minutes but it it wasn't going to uh, completely sustain me and in particular there was a section of course that is actually on trail and those are the most dangerous sections for me really because those are the parts where my mind thinks that it can disengage and shut off. Like I don't have to stay focused on navigation or on horrible technical terrain uh, uh, underfoot. My mind kind of says, no, no, really. Like I can just take a break now um, and eventually drift off and uh, struggle to keep my eyes open at that point. So I got to the first water drop about a third of the way around the loop, uh, which is near an access road. Um, I looked out and and saw some muddy tire tracks in that road. And I I thought, well, it it was cold last night. That mud is probably still cold. That that looks like a perfect spot to to lie down and and try to get another nap. So I walked out there, um, poured a bit more water over myself, uh, just to make sure I was the right uncomfortable temperature and laid down and uh you know next thing i i remember looking up and here comes this 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 guy walking by with with his two kids and uh what i assumed to be his wife and i just uh instinctively said like oh hey hey kit and like he said oh that's a john kelly nap if, if i've ever seen one and just laughed and like I I said I mumbled something about it being Barkley Barkley in loop five and I, I needed to get a little bit of sleep and they just they kept walking. Um I, I think his wife gave me a bit of a look like I was I was crazy, which was totally justified. Um but they, they just kept on and I, I laid back down. I ended up not getting any sleep because I poured too much water on myself and I was too cold uh, to even fall asleep to begin with. Uh, and and after the race, I was just uh, I I really thought about it the the next day, and I was like, like that couldn't have really happened. I mean, a I haven't seen him in twenty years or, or talked to him in twenty. Like, I, I how would I have even recognized him? Like, I I couldn't recognize him. And, and then you know who who just who walks by a guy in the woods laying down in muddy tire tracks on a Thursday morning. And just keeps on, keeps on going. Like everything's okay. It's all normal, all good. And so I was, I was pretty convinced that like I had actually hallucinated this, which I was a little bit excited about because I've never actually had uh, a full-on hallucination like a lot of uh, multi-day ultra runners get. And I feel I've missed out on the experience there. But just to be sure, I, I I chased him down on on LinkedIn of all places and sent him a message and said, you know. It's gonna sound weird, but did, like, did you go for a hike in Frozen Head with your family uh, last last Thursday? And he said, "Yeah, that was us." Um, he, I, I just finished telling the kids about Barkley, and I uh, didn't know it was uh, it was it was going on uh, that week. But uh, then then we saw you there and uh, knew about your previous experience, so thought thought it was uh, you know we, we we shouldn't shouldn't disrupt you. And, uh, you know, it, it is, it's a great thing that he, he did have that knowledge or else uh, he, he probably would have insisted on dragging me off the mountain and, and getting, me, getting, getting me to safety. 
That was such a great story. Just like, I felt like I was there reading it on Instagram. You did such a good job of like laying that story out. And I was like, my jaw like hit the floor. I'm like, oh my goodness, there's no way that's real. So that was really well done on your uh, Instagram explanation of that. <laughs> we were on a Thank run you. later that day. And he, he actually was like, we need to stop everything. I need to tell you this story. Did you see this online? So he was, we're, it was so great. I did a terrible job of explaining it. So you, I was like, you need to go right when we get home and look at these posts because they're incredible. <laughs> but yeah, so, I, you know, I, I reconnected with him and, and hopefully uh, I'll join him for a, a hike out sometime where I'm, you know, a little, taking more, it yeah, a little more coherent. Maybe <laughs> get maybe get his side of the encounter because I'm, I'm sure that I'm not remembering it with full full clarity with everything that I said. Yeah, that'll be a wild, uh, wild story to hear from his perspective for sure. <laughs> um, so you've done Barclays six times now and finished twice. So is this something you're looking to like? Do you have the hunger to go back and do it again and try and finish a third time? Is that hunger living well, inside I, you right now? I, I think the um, you know, the difference between two and three is is much less than the difference between one and two. Uh, so, you know, it was a huge thing for me to, uh, confidence boost and really everything, uh, that I'm, that I was able to mentally will myself, uh, to, to this finish, to keep myself motivated and driven to do it, uh, in the absence of that kind of allure of becoming a finisher, uh, you know, to, to know that I, I can control myself uh that that much is uh is, is again just huge confidence boost and uh going forward it's it's a race that i i truly enjoy it at this point i have a i'm at a good spot on on training for it on not stressing out about it or having it be some consuming part of my life it's uh, an opportunity to to go out there and uh, run through the woods and the mountains that I love and share them with uh, great people from all over the world. So I, I'm back to living nearby. Uh, and I, as, as long as uh, I feel I'm capable of a finish or I'm helping people um, possibly get that themselves by, by being out there with my experience and my course knowledge, uh, I, I don't see a, a real reason not to. I'm sure there will be years where like there will be a conflict, there will be something else I want to do that's at the same time. And so, you know, probably not an annual thing, but uh, I, I'm sure I will be back at some point. You feel, um, you know, this was the first year that there were finishers since 2017 when you, when you finished. Um, do you believe that having the other two out on the course um, helped you with that finish without that, that, you know, the hanging carrot of I've never been able to finish before? Uh, so it was, um, it was kind of interesting this year with, there were, there were a lot of strong uh, people out there and uh, experienced veterans uh, between three finishers and, and a number of fun run finishers. And we were split into a few groups. And so, you know, towards the end of loop two, uh, as, as I see everyone uh, on a little out and back, back section, I'm still seeing like, wow, there's a dozen people who could still at this point finish. And as it turns out, the three of us that did finish, we were in different groups. And so it, I I didn't run much at all with, with Carl or, or Aurelian. We were all in kind of separate out there, but it definitely helped that we were each in groups and sharing sharing that load. And um, again, having uh, someone there to, to prevent catastrophe. Hmm. That's so great. And one of the things that you said in your recap was it's the finishers that miss out on the Barkley experience. They don't get to discover their limits, but we have a lot more time out there to think to contemplate on what on earth it is that we're doing and why. Assuming that my loops average 12 hours, I've spent 10 days out wandering these mountains, stripped down to my bones with no distractions and nowhere to hide from myself. That's a lot of time to think. So I have follow-up questions. The first is being, you know, what does it look like for you when you hit your limits? Uh, well, which limits is, is one question there. Barkley tests a lot of them. 
um, wh whether it kind of be my, my physical limits or my mental limits or my, my sleep deprivation limits. Um, it's, it, it's, it's tough. Um, and the, the biggest thing uh, is, is constantly pulling back um, previous experiences uh, kind of pulling from my mental reservoir of uh, past things that I've done, where I've I've pushed through the low points where things have looked uh, pretty awful and and hopeless and impossible, but knowing that I can I can make it through those moments, I I can pop out the other side, I can hit another high, probably not as high as I was before, but you know I I can get going again. Um, and then also just remembering uh, something something might feel like my limit. It, it, minds typically do a, a very uh, good job of trying to convince us that. And it, so many things that I, I previously thought with my limits are are, are not, uh, not not even close. Uh, you know, when I first started doing these things again, if you told me I'd even be attempting these things, much less succeeding at them, like I, I would just said you were crazy. Like it's not something I would have ever even uh, imagined or thought about doing. And so, um, you know, I'm definitely closer to my limits now. I think I have a much better grasp of them, but but still, uh, there are things that in the moment might feel like you're there. It might feel like it's impossible, uh, and it. It probably isn't. And uh, I will add the caveat to that, that doing some of these multi-day things, like, you know, you, you can get yourself in, in actual dangerous situations. And so a big part of experience is learning, like, this is discomfort, this is danger. And, and knowing the difference between the two of like, yeah, I can deal with the discomfort. That's my body trying to trick me into thinking that this is my limit versus, oh, hey, this other thing, like I'm going to do serious long-term damage to myself or worse if I, I try to continue through this. I think that's such an important point to make. Um, and it, it, I think that that comes just with the time that you have in the sport. Um, the, the second question that I had with that is, you know, 10 days is a lot of time to think. Um, is there any gifts that Barkley has given you in those 10 days where you've been running, hiking, and sort of wandering in the wilderness? Sorry, any gifts? Any gifts, any thoughts, um, you know, as those those 10 days that you've been thinking, um, you know, I know there's a range of things that you think about, whether it's meeting old friends in the woods yeah. or <laughs> um, what are some of your your key takeaways of those 10 days? Yeah, so I mean, there, there are a lot of lessons learned, um, for sure. A, a lot of things that uh, particularly in, in, you know, doing, doing the whole startup thing, there's a lot of bi-directional uh, things that I've learned there that, that one applies to the other. And, and so uh, we, we've touched on a couple of them, um, but there, there are many more, uh, you know, some of those are general things that I've learned. Some of them are things that I've just learned uh, about myself. Uh, you know, like I, I tend to kind of let small things uh, accumulate into uh, large things before I actually take action. Uh, that's just a tendency of mine to, to kind of say, oh, this is fine. It's fine. I'm still fine. It's good. And, you know, until next thing I notice, I'm, I'm definitely not. Uh, and so being able to kind of nip those things in the bud uh, before they grow is, is personally a big thing for me. But then also just, you know, that being able to enjoy the time out there and appreciate it. And uh, again, sometimes I hit low points, sometimes the conditions are miserable, um, but I'm out there in the mountains uh, getting to explore, getting to have an adventure uh, getting to enjoy that and, and fortunate that, you know, the, these low points that I, that I go through, they are, they're, they're artificial challenges, really, like, they're things that I've chosen to do, I, I, I live a life where, uh, and, you know, most of us in, uh, 
modern society and, and our country are, are able to, to live a life where we don't have to encounter these sort of real um, life-threatening struggles of any sort on a day-to-day -day basis. And so at any point, if I've had enough, um, I, I can quit. And then the worst outcome is that like I, I had I had a good adventure in the mountains and I didn't meet my goal, but I'm done and that's it. There's no real like negative on that. Uh, and whereas a, a lot of the the real life challenges and real life struggles that that people face and, and that you know one day some of these lessons I learn uh, might apply to me uh, for, for myself even. Uh, that that's that's not really a choice. There aren't so many good takeaways and stories from this. So we love it. Uh, so as we uh, start to wrap up here, we just we have a couple final questions for you. Um, one of them, you mentioned you want to go back to Barkley, but is there some other things, other endurance pursuits that also kind of get John Kelly excited for the future? Uh, there are definitely some uh, long FKTs that, that I, I want to do. Um, ranging from, you know, a few days to a, a month plus. Those require, though, a, a big uh, dedication uh, uh, on the life and family and, and career front and in terms of being able to find that chunk of time. Uh, most things that I've done, it generally takes me two or three times before I get an outcome that I feel I'm, I'm really happy with uh, that's uh, representative of what I can do. Uh, so still definitely want to go back to Hard Rock and, and have a better result there where I'm not uh, puking from altitude sickness for four hours at, at an aid station. Uh, Tour de Giant is something where I haven't had a great performance yet, and I'm, I'm actually headed back there this year uh, to, to hopefully do that. Um, and yeah, others will just we'll have to we'll have to see how how things progress there there are many more things uh, that I would love to do than there is time to do them so we'll uh, you know take it a year at a time and, and see how it goes amazing well we're pumped to uh, to follow that journey and one of our final questions we always ra wrap up with is our show is obviously called endurance icons so um, we always like to ask um, who is your endurance icon and why you can also have multiple too. Who inspires you? Yeah, so I mean, I I, I try to to take away uh, from from mul multiple people, or really anyone who's getting out there and and pushing themselves and, and coming up with creative challenges. I mean, if while we're on the topic of of Barkley, one of my early ones was was Jared Campbell, who is still the only three time finisher and uh, is. Uh, I've, I've had the opportunity to run a little bit with him uh, out there, but then, it, you know, the other things he does, again, just his creative pursuits, getting out there and having adventures that he's personally passionate about and, and the way he, he carries himself as a, uh, in his career and, and as, uh, as with his family as well. And so I've, I've definitely tried to use uh big pieces of that as, as a blueprint for my own running and uh, life. And even now he's helping me with some of my uh, energy efficiency improvements to, to my, my home here. He's, he's done, he's gone through that twice now uh, to, to pretty extreme ends on, on his home. So lots to learn from him on that. Look at that learnings well beyond the Barkley course, right? To home improvements. Amazing. <laughs> Um, and and I, I will also uh, earlier we mentioned the math on the teamwork and you know I, I couldn't just let that go so I, I did it on my my calculator here <laughs> on the side and if if you're by yourself and you have a 10 percent chance of messing up on any given decision then after 10 straight decisions there is a 65.1 percent chance that you will have messed up if you are with someone else and there's just, you know, a 10% chance that either of you mess up, then after 10 decisions, there is only a 9.6% chance that you will have both messed up on the same decision. Okay. I think so, that's a good, it's a good like advocacy for teamwork in general. So yeah, I love that well, great Barky Lee formula. 
co collective choice, you know, and, and again, that goes well beyond Barclay. Generally, we make um, we make better decisions as as a group and as a group with uh, diverse skill sets and, and backgrounds uh, going into it. Boom. What a great wrap up. Um, so, John, for those who want to continue to follow your journey on all the amazing things you're doing, what's the uh, best avenues for them to follow you? Uh, I have a blog, randomforestrunner.com. It has links to all my social media handles. Uh, the, the blog, you know, I'll, I'll post race reports, maybe a few things a year, not as often as I wish I had time for. Um, but yeah, the social media uh, is Random Forest Runner as well uh, on Instagram, a uh, variant of that on Twitter to meet their character limits. But that's a, um, that's a bit of a play on words with Random Forest is a uh, an algorithm that, that's used in my profession. It's, it's a machine learning algorithm. And so uh, it's that plus the fact that I enjoy running through random forests. <laughs> There's always a deeper meaning. I love it. Well, John, thank you so much for taking the time today to, uh, to tell us all your stories and lots of amazing lessons today. And uh, we're really looking forward to following your journey as you continue forward, crushing all these amazing uh, endurance events. Yeah, thanks very much. I enjoyed it and y'all have a good rest of your day. Wow, how great was that? I always learned so much from these endurance icons. If you enjoyed the podcast as well, please consider liking us across social media, subscribing to us on YouTube, or giving us a five-star rating on wherever you listen to your podcasts. We appreciate you and your support so much. We wish you happy training and we'll see you back next week.